the group was yes and a friend had given me a ticket and we were in the balcony with the camera I could see it wasn't going to be very good pictures from the balcony you know with the lenses I had but I could see in the aisle some photographers working and once the concert began I thought well maybe if I go down there with this camera maybe they'll think I'm one of them. Welcome to the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I'm Angela Nicholson, and I'm the founder of She Clicks, which is a community for female photographers. In these podcasts, I talk with women in the photographic industry to hear about their experiences, what drives them, and how they got to where they are now. Our guest in this episode is Jill Fermanowski, a music photographer who over the last 50 years has photographed the biggest and best acts around, including Pink Floyd, Bob Marley, The Police, and Oasis. Her images have appeared on album covers and in books and magazines across the globe. Hi, Jill. Thank you so much for joining me on this She Clicks Women in Photography podcast today. It's really lovely to see you. It's a pleasure to be here, Ange. Thank you. Now, last year you celebrated 50 years in the music photography business, but I wonder if you could go back and tell us what it was that first attracted you into photography. My interest in photography came from my dad, who was a very, very good amateur photographer, I was born and was living as a child in a place called Bulawayo in Rhodesia, as it was. It's now Zimbabwe. So a very different kind of lifestyle to what happened when we came to London. My dad was an architect and he, he wasn't very keen on sports or you know, swimming or any of that stuff. His hobbies were listening to jazz, playing guitar in a dance band since when I was a small child. And his other main hobby was photography. So he, he used it for work to photograph buildings, but he also had a dark room at home. And so he took a lot of pictures of us children and the dogs and, I don't know, mainly people, family. And then he would process and print them in the home dark room. And I used to sit on a high stool and watch him. So that magical um, process, I think, went right inside me, plus the music, which I didn't like, by the way, it was jazz. I wasn't keen on it, but... He liked music, he liked photography, and I seem to have made that my career. Was it always going to be your career, photography, or did you do something else first and then make a sideways move? I didn't have any plans to have this as my career at all. In fact, after the age of 11, my parents moved to the UK, and that was utterly traumatic for me coming from a small town in Africa. I didn't fit in very well. I was a felt a bit of an outsider. I found school quite difficult and the only kind of compensation was that it was the 60s in London and the Beatles and I became a member of the fan club and it was a very exciting time for London. So I kind of embraced that and went to an art class on a Saturday at Harrow School of Art. Then when I left my school with, I think I had five, five O levels and um, a portfolio, um, I applied to Harrow School of Art. So I didn't have any idea that I would be anything other than I knew I wanted to go to art school because, well, the Beatles, some of them went to art school and lots of Roxy Music went to art school and all these things. So that was my idea. I did a foundation course at Harrow's School of Art. I wanted to do graphic design, but the school, the, the college thought that I'd be better off applying for a textile design degree course because of my, I think maybe it was oversubscribed in graphics. And so I applied for a textile design degree course at the Central School of Art and Design, which was a prestigious establishment. It's now the Central St. Martin School of Art. So, and I got in. So now we're talking 1971. And how did that lead to you moving into photography? All the students did a two-week course in photography. Photography itself was not a degree course at that time, not at art school, or not at mine anyway. It was considered a service department. Right. You did the two-week photography course so you could photograph your work. Right, got you. But it was taught by professional photographers, including some very eminent ones. So in the second term of 1972, it was, the, the second term of my, of my three-year course, it was our turn at Techstars to do the two-week course. And you got given a Pentax uh, camera, Spotmatic, that they had, a, a roll of colour film on the first day. So so you went out with a colour a roll of coloured transparency film and that got processed overnight, sort of thing, in order to see that you knew how to use the camera, because you'd have to get the exposures right on slide film, wouldn't you? Yes. 
there wasn't much leeway I could make sure. And I had this sort of beginner's luck. I mean, first of all, I was just enamored of having a proper camera. And then also just I had I took some really good pictures on that first roll of film and the tutor was very pleased with me. The second day or the third day, you got a roll of black and white. You did the same. Then the third day or fourth day, you learned to process the film and make a contact sheet. And on the Friday, they gave you a roll of film and another lens and you could photograph what you liked over the weekend. And I went to the Rainbow Theatre that night, Friday night, it was the 14th of January, with the camera. And that's when my career began because I got a job that night by a fluke as a photographer. Oh, wow. Did you have a ticket to see the act? Yes, yes, I did. I had a ticket. The group was yes, and a friend had given me a ticket, and we were in the balcony with the camera. I could see it wasn't going to be very good pictures from the balcony, you know, with the lenses I had. But I could see in the aisle some photographers working. And once the concert began, I thought, well, maybe if I go down there with this camera, maybe they'll think I'm one of them. And the, the interesting thing about that is that once a gig has started, there's nobody about, actually. You know, there's only, you, you just have to walk down. I went downstairs into the auditorium, opened the door, walked down the central aisle, and nobody stopped me, crouched down with the other photographers and took my one roll of film. Yeah. And at the end of that concert, I was sort of obviously over the moon, so one of them, uh, or two of them actually, were, were working for the theatre and they had to go away on a project and they asked me if I was interested to take over, thinking, or perhaps I even said that I might be professional. Well, I was 18 and I'd only done four days of photography. <laughs> Fantastic. And on Monday, I went to college and I said, I've got a job. Can you teach me everything very fast? Because I've got a job. It wasn't a paid job, incidentally. It was, you got your expenses, you got, you know, you had to provide some pictures if they needed them for the theatre. And the magic was you had an access pass, all areas. And also the pass said on it, photographer. Right. So to me, that was written down. It was like a passport. What are you? I'm a photographer. Where can you go? Everywhere. That's for me. Fantastic. And did the expenses cover film? Yes, just about. Uh, just about. Uh, certainly didn't cover more than that. But within a few months, when I was getting quite good at taking the live shots, I would take 10 by 8s down to the music press, Melody Maker, actually. And you'd put your pictures on the on the picture editor's desk, and then you know then they might use it, you know, the, the, for the next uh, issues of of the newspaper which came out on a Thursday. So if you were shooting on the weekend, you'd stay up all night and, and process the film, do a few prints in the college darkroom, take them to Menzies Maker on Monday or Tuesday, and then they may get used in the paper on Wednesday for Thursday. And I always remember sort of going with these prints and you know seeing other people's prints that were a lot better and a lot better photographs than mine, just putting them down and running off. Um, but eventually I got uh, better at it. And then by the end of that first year, so I did the course in 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 uh, January, in December of that year, I had my first cover of Melody Maker with one of my pictures. But they wouldn't give me a credit. That was my problem. Why not? I think it was either the... The actual Melody Maker photographers, you know, protecting their ground. But at that time, I hadn't got a credit for a few of these pictures. And when I got the cover, I, I plucked up courage to see the editor, whose name was Ray Coleman. And he was like a schoolmaster. And it was very much a boys club. The women in there were secretaries mainly. There was maybe one or two freelance journalists, no other photographers from Melody Maker. But I said to him, could I have a credit next time? And he, he, he sort of did that with the glasses, you know. You'll get one when you deserve one. And then I never did get credit from Melody Maker until they changed editors. <laughs> I got credits eventually from, from all the music press. And in fact, we used to get massive credits at NME. But for a, for a year or so, there were no credits. Wow. That's astonishing. You took a picture that was deemed good enough to go on the cover, but you couldn't have your name on it. That's astonishing. Gosh. And what would you say were your biggest challenges during those early years, apart from getting recognition? I think being young really was a stumbling block because being female was obviously 
problematic in its own way too, but it had advantages. It really did. So I I tried to sort of balance that out. But being young and female, was that was a little bit, that was problematic because you're so green. You don't know whether you can charge for it. You don't know if you can ask for a permission to take pictures. Um, the Rainbow Theatre at that time um, ha- was under various different managements and they would open and close and then a new manager would come in and so on. And in between that, I was trying to get to do shows in other places, which meant I had to go through a promoter or record company or a manager. And that was also uh, quite tricky. And then, you know, then the road crew might hit upon you and, you know, or the doorman. And, you know, but on the other hand, you had to do a bit of charming your way past a doorman, but then you didn't want them coming on to you. So uh, I was balancing, you know, I was trying to make myself as invisible as possible. And certainly I wouldn't be wearing stilettos and a mini skirt. I was wearing for the most part, very ordinary clothes, preferably black and, uh, you know, baggy. You said there weren't any female photographers in the area you were working in at that time. There, there was one, there was Penny Smith. Penny Smith had begun a, a, around the same time as me, but she had a much better job. You see, she worked for NME. So she had a regular job, which I think may even had some money attached to it. So in the pit, I used to see Penny. And um, we were always giggling if there was some very macho artist with the bulge in his trousers, we'd be like going, mm. <laughs> We had a few laughs in there, me and Penny. And she used to carry her equipment in a little child suitcase. I, I switched to Nikon at some point around that, you know, the second or third year. But Penny always used, I think, a Pentax in her little suitcase. The pit had male photographers in it the rest of the time. And some of them were quite bullying. You know, I remember being elbowed out of the way, like, get out of my way, you know, you're you're not as important as me. But then also we got some help from some photographers and I, I used to ply the nicer ones with technical questions that I'd probably apply to you now, Ange, <laughs> during a drum solo or something, you know. <laughs> How do you process your film? You know, and Mike Putnam would go, uh, 68 degrees, microfair, nine and a half minutes. And then, okay, thank you. That was how I learned from them. <laughs> There's nothing like those one-to-one conversations. Okay, you're shouting over a drum solo, but you know, actually hearing it from the horse's mouth is great, isn't it? It's a great way of learning. Yes, I thank all the ones that helped me. Barry Wenzel was another one. He worked for Melody Make. He was just a darling. He used to print. He lived in Soho and he had an enlarger in his lounge or something and he would have the whole roll of film. He didn't cut them into sixes. He just took the whole roll of film and just sort of put it through the enlarger till he hit upon one that was sharp and he'd print that one. Right. That was also useful to learn. Yeah, a bit quicker, I suppose. How long would you say you were, were doing that kind of thing before you actually considered yourself or a professional or you were actually making some money from it? Well, I was making these little bits of money and then occasionally a promoter will, would buy one. Pink Floyd uh, were the first band that I kind of did more work with than the others and their manager bought a few. And then around 19... 19- 74, when I left college, I started to get a little bit of work that was not just live shots in the pit. I, my first assignment was actually Stevie Wonder. Well, aside from some shots of the Floyd that I did for myself, but my first assignment was some, somebody was ill and I got took their job of photographing Stevie Wonder in a hotel room. And that was that was the first time I'd had to encounter actually coming, you know, really face to face with with the musician and having to talk to them and deal with other journalists, photographer teams and so on. And that's a very different experience to photographing a live act, isn't it? Because when you're in the pits, you're looking at them, waiting for them to do something. But when you're the photographer and they're looking at you saying, what do you want me to do? You've got to give a bit of direction. Or did they tell you what they wanted? Well, they did. You know, then you're on your own. No, you're right. I mean, the great thing about the music press is they didn't tell you anything particularly. They just said, get good shots. <laughs> you know, I mean, there was no, it wasn't really art directors as such. Yeah, don't muck it up. Yeah, don't <laughs> it up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was really it. I mean, my first shoot, that first shoot with Stevie Wonder, I think, oh, I could have done a lot better. But it was okay. You know, I was learning and I, you know, got something of the atmosphere of it. And I saw other photographers in that room, you know, the next lot along. I was watching what they were doing. Some had flashes. I didn't have that for ages. And with the Floyd, who were even earlier than Stevie Wonder, with them, my first shots of them in a dressing room, I used a flash, but I didn't realise that the flash 
only covered 50 millimeter lenses and not 28 millimeter lenses. So my pictures from that time have got fall off. Right. On the sides because because the, the, the flash wasn't covering it. I didn't know how to use a flash anyway. All, all of these things now seem like a joke, but I mean, it was that sort of time. You were learning. Once you started going with the music photography and you did the Stevie Wonder photograph, was it always going to be music photography from there on? I think it was. Like What happened to me after a year of doing this photography at the Rainbow is that the college said to me, hang on a minute, you're not doing much in the way of textile design. We couldn't help but notice you're always in the dark room or, you know. And um, they said, why don't you leave? If, if you want to do photography, you want to go to the London College of Printing, where that's where they do photography, not here in this art school. <laughs> We're an art school here, not a photography place. And, but, I, but the London School of Printing was more of a sort of place for people in lab coats. You know, it was that more that style of teaching photography at that time. And I really liked being an art school. And it was a really free atmosphere. And I didn't want to leave art school. And the photography tutors who amongst whom was um, a fashion photographer called Ian Hessenberg and a photojournalist called Jürgen Schaderberg. They're both eminent photographers. They kind of supported me and they got me moved to graphics because in graphics you could kind of get away with being in the dark room and doing photography. And that's where I wanted to be in the first place. So I had to catch up. So I did, in fact, my degree that I stayed for the full three years is in graphic design. So, so in fact, yeah. So I, I didn't think though about doing anything other than, you know, just making a go of this, of, of, of this opportunity that had come up. It was just so exciting and so interesting. And also, I had fallen in love with photography before falling in love with photographing the bands. There was only four days in it, but I told you I had beginner's luck with my first roll of film. So I was in love with photography. I was a shy person, and the camera made me feel more confident. It just seemed natural that I should, you know, I felt so much more confident when I was doing that stuff. I was in love with photography and then four days later I was also in love with music and that combination couldn't be bettered. So I managed somehow to have lasted all these years without really having a proper job. Although as a youngster, I, I did shorthand and typing and was a temporary secretary and did that sort of thing as well. Has that ever helped you out in any way, would you say, doing the typing? Absolutely, yeah, definitely. I mean, when we got computers, having done shorthand and typing, touch typing, my goodness, that was useful. And um, and also, I don't think I've ever taken it for granted that, uh, that I've been lucky. You know, it, it, it didn't fall in my lap. The, the opportunity fell in my lap, but not the not the slog that managed to keep me on the on the on the road to to, to doing it really. Well, I do believe in the thing that people say about you make your own luck, don't you? Because you have to say yes to things and put the effort in and turn up and do a job and adapt and keep going. So, yeah, but I know what you mean. Please excuse this interruption. This podcast is sponsored by MPB, the world's largest platform for used photography and videography kit. MPB has transformed the way people buy, sell and trade equipment, making photography more accessible, affordable and sustainable. MPB is proud to partner with SheClicks to help support women photographers and their work. Okay, let's get back to the show. Now, you've shot extensively on film and, you know, you've moved to digital now. How do you think digital technology has impacted upon your career? It was a bit of a shocker, actually, for me, because I was shooting from 1972 and I didn't really go digital shooting-wise until about 2005. So I was quite late to shooting digitally. But in 1997, on the cusp of the digital revolution, I had a very big exhibition of Oasis in the Roundhouse. Everybody, all the businesses and all the sponsors were very interested in being involved with Oasis. So I got given an Epson printer, a Kodak scanner, a Kodak digital camera that had a battery about the size, you know, that sort of size battery. Yeah. <laughs> And then Olympus were launching their first consumer digital camera at my exhibition. And so actually in 1997, I was right bang in the, in the digital revolution, right on the cusp. And Photoshop and all of that, and websites, it all went like all in one. And so actually what I really, really loved was the digital printing. Because until digital printing, if you wanted to make a print from a transparency, it was very expensive and the background was black because they were reversals. And I didn't shoot much on neg, colour neg film at the time. So, so to get a decent print, colour print, was really 
problematic. And as soon as digital came along and those first Epson machines that we used for that exhibition, we used a mixture of different printings. Each print in that exhibition said how it was made and on what and how it was shot because I thought that was important. We had, you know, we had a, a, an, an Olympus studio where you could go to the exhibition and have your picture taken like on a zebra, like there was a kind of a big backdrop where Noel was walking across a zebra crossing and you could dress up as Liam in a, in a parka and shades and have your picture taken <laughs> and on an Olympus camera. And at the end of the show, you could walk out with a little print. This was a complete revolution. That's in the website. So at the end of that um, series of things in 1998, I started my first proper website, which was rockarchive.com. Because I'd been left with all this kit, you see. I had all this stuff left over from the exhibition. So I, you could say I'm a very early exponent of, of the digital because also I love Photoshop. I just thought it was magical. And I, I knew how, I learned how to use it from the very first version of it. Photoshop and printing. What I didn't like were the cameras initially. They were, they were terrible. They, they had such lag. You didn't get the moment, did you? You could go for a walk around the block and then it would fire. That's what it felt like anyway, you know? <laughs> yes, very clunky. Clunky, slow. Yeah, that must have been very tough for photographing live. Yeah, this, the quality was, was poor, you know? I mean, it was all right to sort of do snaps of your, you know, your kids and stuff, but not, not for profession. I've always been very keen on printing. I like a beautiful print. And the digital printing was fantastic from the start, although at that point it wasn't yet archival. It became archival a couple of years later. Yes, a gradual shift to cyan or green yes. images as you, as you watch them almost. Yes. I was wondering if you had skipped film and gone straight to digital, whether you would have ever done any of your joiner images. Because I feel like, you know, when you get a packet of film or you, a, a prints and you tip them out onto the table, it's also almost an automatic thing to start thinking about making a joiner. Yeah. And I know you've done some absolutely fantastic ones. Do you think you would have done that in digital from a start? I know you have done digital ones. Uh, well, I started doing them most because of David Hockney in the, in, in the mid-80s because of his seeing that exhibition that he did. Incidentally, also the Quantel paintbox computer, pre-Photoshop, yeah? I mean, you know, I did a couple of montages or joiners, if you like, digitally pre that exhibition because... I needed to do artwork for Madness, for example, and I did an artwork for Sinead O'Connor that involved montaging pictures. There you went to a lab and then they, they scanned those negs and then, and then a man in a lab coat would say, where do you want to move it to? And you'd sit there. I mean, to me, it was fabulous. You know, all, all of those paint boxy things, Photoshop, or digital processing, what wasn't okay was shooting a picture or shooting the moment that seemed to have gone out the window. And until 2005, when they bettered the lag, that I, I couldn't use it, really. But yes, I think that I would have done the joiners anyway. I think that was the joiners started on film and, and morphed into digital, you know, just naturally. Okay. And when you were happy with a digital camera, what did you actually opt for? Do you remember? Yeah, I'm a Nikon user or was, and I, you know, I've been using Nikons. I wanted a Nikon. I think it was something 100 when I finally decided, in fact, what, why I did it was I had a job that had to be done digitally in 2005. It just had to be done. And I thought, okay, right, this is the moment. I'm going to go and get a digital camera. I thought, I'll get that Nikon. And there was a waiting list for it. So I got a Canon. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that was the end of it. I just, I got a Canon E or something or other. And that was the end of it. And then I kind of regretted it because I had all these Nikon lenses and, and you know, a Nikon person. But from that point on, I, I was using a Canon. They're very different now. We switched to mirrorless photography. I know you've got an R5. Have you got to grips with things like the eye detection yet? Do you find that really useful for what you do? Well, as you know, I saw you at the photo show and I, was, you know, I had to go and find somebody to help me because every time a camera changes, and this included during the film era from a, a Nikon FE to an, you know, an F4 or something, I and mean, it was like, oh, this is so traumatic, <sighs> you know, because really you get your great shots because you're fluent. It's like a language. It's, it's the fluency with the camera. So I've actually got loads of equipment here at the moment because I'm shooting something this week and I, I didn't have enough lenses for that R5. So, so I've been lent some and so I'm still learning. And I also use a, because I like using Leica, so I'm using a Leica M10P and I've just got myself, I've borrowed a Leica Q2 
Oh, nice. And there's a couple of things I don't know how to use on that either. I'm going to have to go and see Sarah Lee and ask her. Every day is a learning day, isn't it? Every day is a learning day, yeah. You've been, you know, shooting music for quite a long time, but do you still feel, or did you ever feel under pressure in the pit that, you know, you've only got a limited amount of time and you really want to get a great picture that you're going to be able to sell to a picture editor? Or have have you always taken that in your stride or have you just got comfortable with it now? You mean doing just three songs or something like that? Yeah. There was a crossover around the 80s when bands said, no, no, you can't. You can't sit in the pit for the whole show, which we used to do in the rain, but you smoke a cigarette and then, you know, chat to the photographers. No, I mean, that changed in, yeah, in the 1980s into the 90s to being three songs. And for me, that was terribly frustrating, really. I remember what I did do with a couple of shoots in the in the 90s where I, where I wanted to go to the show for various reasons. The Rolling Stones was one and you 2 were another where you only got three songs in both cases. I made a joiner. I thought if, I, if I've if i only got three songs, I'll use the three songs to make one picture. Right. So I shot the three songs and then I joined them all up. Yeah. So just I, I used it, you know, in some sort of way that was satisfying to me because really you want the last three songs, not the first three songs. That's the thing, when everyone's warmed up and really going for it. That's it. But then because of all the image thing, you know, and then maybe they're sweaty and their clothes aren't quite so immaculate I, d- I don't know really most of the bands I've worked with in the 90s and the 90s onwards gave me access to all areas and I could shoot the whole show from anywhere so I, I didn't have that frustration but the other day actually I went to photograph Liam who was doing um, some a, a show at the forum and I went just for fun and and his manager said yeah we can give you a ticket and I said can I just take some pictures and they went well as long as you don't mind doing the same as the other photographers I said well what's that if they said one song and I was thinking, and then it was very poor lighting as well. I thought it was a joke, really. And I stood in the pit with the other photographers, who the proper press photographers, doing one song. The hilarious thing is that Liam came over to me in the pit. He saw me there and he shook my hand. So that, that used up about 12 seconds. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. I shot one artist from a pit one time and they said, you can stay in for three songs, but you've got to pick a side and stay there. Oh, uh, yeah. I was like, Okay, and that was a bit strange. That was very frustrating. I picked the wrong side because she had the microphone on this side. Oh, yeah. So she had a big spot on the side of her face, but that was quite annoying. Yeah. Do you change your approach depending on the type of music that the the artist is playing? Not really, actually, no. I don't change my approach, but, you know, there's different tents I've got to, you know, there's some we've got massive light shows behind them now or exploding, you know, uh, theatrical things happening or they you know, that kind of thing, then you, then obviously you, you're shooting in a different way than you would do, say, to a band that are just on a stage with a couple of lights, uh, giving it their all, where maybe you can get in close. Possibly some bands won't have you photo- using flash. I, don't, I tend not to use flash anyway, but occasionally. In punk, for example, during punk era, there was no lighting. So punk punk images are, are, are flashlit images, and they're very effective because they look like, you know, frozen animals and the headlamps of a car is what I say you know so you have to adapt and there there was Pink Floyd I was forever smearing my lens with Vaseline and making it all kind of psychedelic which is which of course you don't have to do in Photoshop you can do the psychedelic but afterwards yeah so you sort of try to match your style of photography to suit their style of music or act I suppose presentation yeah I to me I was doing Jules Holland a couple of nights ago in the in the National Gallery I was just thinking, this is so wonderful. I know it's going to stop me. It was only a short show he was doing. But I mean, I was playing with the camera. I was just doing a meditation. I mean, you just, it's such a wonderful thing to do. I, it's my favorite in a way of all the kinds, even though it's nice to meet them and all that. But what I really like is you go on the stage and do your thing and leave me to do mine. I'll, I'll, I'll find something in there that'll be unexpected and wonderful. Great. Have you got any plans for any further exhibitions or to tour the exhibitions that you've put on recently? Well, I'm hoping to take the retrospective exhibition, which was called in Manchester, it was called um, Photographing the Invisible. And in London, we altered it slightly to No Music, No Life, which was only because it was a slightly different exhibition, but it'd probably be back to being Photographing the Invisible uh, to Europe and possibly to Scotland as well. Fantastic. Because... I think it seems a shame that these 
exhibitions that I've put together, and this is not just my ones, but the ones that Rock Archive have done, fantastic curated exhibitions, that they've got no touring circuit and that there is no permanent space for these things. Mm. I'm sort of very aware of that and, and trying to do something about it as best I can and have done for 25 years because the attendance in Manchester was, was massive for all the exhibitions we've done there. You know, like 25,000, I mean, massive. And, and yet there's no funding. The library's penniless. I mean, thanks to MPB, really, who have been incredibly supportive, that's just enabled us to do stuff, really. And, you know, but really, it, it, there should be a bit more, I think, to enable touring exhibitions. Yeah, I agree. The exhibition in Manchester in particular, I mean, I could imagine it being an underestimate because there's so many people milling around, you know, going in and out, yes. having a look. I don't know how they keep track of everybody, but we had a She Clicks meet up there and it was absolutely fantastic. We loved it. And we also went to the one at the Proud Galleries in London, which was fantastic. The thing that really, well, I love the images, obviously, but one of the things that really caught my eye was the video of you and Noel talking together. And that was really engaging. You've obviously developed a very firm connection that was was really nice and you're talking about your work have you got similar relationships with other musicians that you've worked with Noel is very special because he's he's so interested in photography and he's always had a vision that it was important just by the by there's there is a film that's been made about my work called the invisible photographer oh it's in the bag but we're waiting for the last bit of funding right. to do the music clearances that were very expensive. It's been made over a period of many years. And it, within that, there's other artists I've worked with closely. So, I mean, Chrissy Hind is another person that a very similar conversation could take place, although she has a different attitude towards photography. Nick Mason is another. Nile Rogers is another. So these are, these are some of my clients that I've worked with for many years. My best body of work is Oasis. There's no question in my mind that that's when I did, I've done, you know, I was at my peak. I was just the right age. I was in my 40s. And it was a good age to be working in that way. I had a lot of experience. And they permitted closeness. They really permitted, they wanted, they, they didn't mind it. And not all artists can handle it. Some can't stand it. So then you're working in a different way. But there was a wonderful mix. And, and each artist is a little bit different with how they approach their image although they're all image conscious in some way. And and I have had long working relationships with, with quite a lot of artists, many actually. And also there's some that I've never photographed that I wish I had to. Yes, I can imagine. That would, before we move on, I'd just like to talk about Rock Archive because you mentioned it in passing earlier, but what actually was your inspiration to start it? It was, that, it was having that kit left over from that Oasis exhibition at the Roundhouse. That exhibition was was mega. I mean, it, it was it was a bit like a V&A exhibition. And when I think about it now, I was thinking it was way ahead of its time. I mean, it was the roundhouse is in a gigantic building and we had the whole of the roundhouse, the entire, and, and it was before it was renovated. So it was a massive round space. And we, you know, we did up lighting. We had, I made a little film to go with it. We had holograms. We had extra large prints, there were backlit transparencies, it had its own soundtrack. I mean, this is 1997. Wow. And then it, and it had its own lighting rig. It was a proper touring exhibition. There was a truck that came and it went to uh, the Hacienda in Manchester, which was, you know, an iconic place. Then it went to the tramways in Glasgow. And then it ended up in Dublin at the Centre of Photography in Dublin. And I, th- I was thinking, great, this is, I was shown how how popular and innovative this can be now. We'll get to rock and roll museum. No doing. Nothing happened. And that's, you know, 24. But I, after that exhibition, I had the scanner, the printer, um, a website, and then a new website. I thought rockarchive.com would be good because that would be more generic. Yep. And that next time I do such an exhibition, it could be, you know, um, a more generic one, not just one band. And then I... I thought, well, what will we do? We, we're not going to be a picture agency. We, we could just make prints because we've got all this kit. The inks, inks became archival a couple of years later. So from going from a website, we thought, oh, we can make prints and then we could sell those online. Yeah. And then I thought, well, not just mine. I put Thirsty and I thought my friend Storm Thorkerson from Hypnosis, he said, yeah, great idea. Let's put some of my artwork in there. Barry Wenzel, who you know, showed me how to print and... 
other people might part you know we had a bunch of photographers that each contributed maybe five or six images not many i just said to them just give me a uh, give me like a few of your images not your best ones and we will exclusively make prints from those and then it grew and grew so there was something that was like 100 photographers or more you know all kind of like it became like a portal for rock photography because everybody had their picture and then and then you could find out more about rock photography as well and uh, the problem with it is that uh, it was not particularly profitable we gave photographers a lot of you know very good royalties we didn't get funded by anybody and all I've managed to do, although I'm very proud of it, was keep it going for 25 years. And it grew and grew. And I still think that actually it's it was ahead of its time, really. And then we started curating exhibitions in places that don't have exhibitions, like libraries, like the Manchester Central Library, the Barbican Library. We've done four or five exhibitions in there. Put them on the map, you know. Kind of did a punk exhibition there, you know, which had more visitors at one point than the Martin Parr one, which was in the proper gallery. People were going in, where's the punk exhibition? And I'm going, what, in the gallery? And they went, no, in the library. And, and as a result of that, now there's a fantastic two-tone exhibition in the library in the Barbican, which has also had less massive visitors all going through the books and people stamping books into a space that's now been made, tailor-made for them because there isn't anywhere else to show the stuff. I can't, the Tate have never asked me. The Photographer's Gallery have never asked me. Nobody has come forward and said, would you like to have an exhibition? Nobody wanted to have an exhibition. You know, we did an exhibition in Manchester on the Manchester music scene using the collective and the new photographers bringing in their stuff. That hadn't been done before and we had nowhere to put it afterwards. It just is crazy, really. Yeah, that is a real shame because like you say, it's, you know, there's such a depth of photography there and there's huge interest in it as well. I mean, particularly... Well, you know, looking back, people look at the, the images of the artists at the time when they were at their peak, when they loved them the most, they were producing the music they still love to listen to. And they look back and it brings all sorts of memories back. So if anyone here hasn't had a look at Rock Archive, you really must go. But don't just do it when you're about to rush out or, you know, you need to, you've got the dinner on because you'll be there for quite some time. I've, I've lost quite a few <laughs> hours going through the images and thinking, oh, one day I might get a print of that one. And, you know, there's a huge array and I think some of the images would probably surprise people that they could actually buy that as a print. Yeah, that's true. And and um, also I'd recommend if anybody goes to look at some of the videos because what I've also done with Rock Archive over the years is try to film some of the photographers because nobody else, nobody was doing it. Right, yeah. It's madness. So for example, Don Hunstein, who photographed several Bob Dylan uh, sessions and has got classic stuff. I just went to New York and filmed him on a small camera and then, and then he became, you know, uh, he had dementia and couldn't, couldn't talk about it. And then he died. I, I took an actual film, a, a, a cameraman with me to New York to film a guy called Al Wertheimer, who was Elvis's photographer, who was in his 80s. I mean, what stories that man had. And I think he was on the front line. You want to ask him about Elvis. You know, you don't want to ask someone, you know, somebody writes text on it. That man sat next to Elvis on the train. <laughs> And again, uh, on Punk, we, we made sure that we interviewed uh, some of the photographers working there. And I still think I could do a lot more with that. I've got a little iron in the fire that I've got my fingers crossed that I may be able to do a little bit more of that sort of thing. But at the same time, I'm aware that I'm now 70 and I'm, my own archive is neglected. And that's why I did the retrospective because, you know, given my life over, really, if you like, to uh, willingly, each one of these things takes time. Somebody must take this over. Somebody must run with it because I won't be able to do it. You know, I'm going to have to step down at some point soon. Mm. Yes, or well, hopefully someone will step forward. Okay, well, I think it's probably a good point to go to six from She Clicks. And I've got 10 questions from She Click as I would like you to answer six questions, please, by choosing numbers from one to 10. So if you could give me your first number, please. Uh, number nine. Number nine. What was the first image you had published? Do you remember what that was? That's from Liz. That's a very good question. Lisa. It was probably no more than, you know, two inches by one inch, and it was probably a live shot from the rainbow. So but I was probably over the moon with it. But my, my, the one I remember was, of course, the cover. Okay. I don't think you said who the cover shot was of. Yes, it was Roger Daltrey of The Who um, in Tommy. 
And it's a really good one, that one. But the newspaper, of course, looked like, you know, it was very bad reproduction. So, it was, you know, it's just newsprint, black and white. Yeah. All right. So could I have your second number, please? Two. Number two. Do you have a preferred camera and lens setup for photographing live music? If so, what is it? And several people ask that one. Yeah. Depends on how close you are. If you're in the pit or in the, in the centre aisle, you want a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200, preferably a 2.8. So uh, in other words, it doesn't shut down to f5.6 when you zoom in. Okay. Do you take two cameras in so you've got, you don't have to keep swapping lenses? I do, yeah. If you have to go further back, I had a times 2 converter for the 70 to 200, making it like a 400. But I've noticed it. If, you know, if, you, if you're having to be at the mixing desk or further back, you're going to need something much longer and fast and faster. It should be some huge cannon of, a, you know, like a, a missile of some kind. Yeah, something really big and heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Are you ever tempted to use a monopod or anything to help with that weight? No, I, I find them irritating. I, I have used them, but on the whole, I, I liked, I'm very restless when I'm shooting. I'm going here and there and I'm going to take the thing and knock somebody over with it. No, so I tend not to, no. Okay. So, could I have your third number, please? Uh, where are we? Let's have number one, then. Okay. Oh, this, is, this is a good one. This is from Philippa. With film, we have to decide if we're going to shoot in colour or black and white before we start shooting. But with digital, we have the flexibility to swap between them fairly easily. Do you still make that decision before you shoot or afterwards? Afterwards. Absolutely. I do, yeah. It's, a, it's an instinctive decision. And sometimes I'll offer both alternatives if, if a client is asking. I think it looks better in black and white. And quite often I do, by the way. But I still, I still offer both if they want it. When you're taking a shot, do you sometimes think, oh, this is going to look great in black and white at that time and then make a mental note to do it? No, I mean, I'm usually just trying to catch a moment. That's my priority. I'm very rarely shooting setups. I'm usually winging it somewhere. So I'm not normally thinking about how it'll end up. I just hope it'll be sharp and that, that I've caught something. I don't really worry too much about, you know, that I'm not one of those photographers that like this working in the studio who really has to consider everything and do carefully. Okay, so your fourth number, please. Number four. Okay. Who would you like to photograph but haven't yet? And again, several people ask that question. Do you know there's quite a lot? I, get, I become very excited by, by new bands if I see something I like. So I did actually manage to photograph them, and so much so that I actually followed them, which was um, Gabriel's, for example. I love Jacob from Gabriel's. I just, so I did manage to do Gabriel's, but the, I, I was like a fan. I, I went there and I said, please, can I do it, and all that kind of thing. So I did manage that one. But I'd like, I think, you know, I'd love to do a portrait of, of you know, like Billie Eilish. Ray, I think, is, very, is a very interesting artist. And then my granddaughter, I ask her, and then she's give, given me, well, this one called Boone, his name is, something Boone. And I looked him up and I thought, oh, he's very good as well. And then when I go to, to Glastonbury, usually every Glastonbury, I discover some new talent and I get very excited by them. And also, I, there was some in the past that I never managed to photograph properly. David Bowie is one from, well, I photographed him, but I had problems with that his management over what I took. And then I didn't do Nina Simone. I should have done that. Joni Mitchell would have been great. I followed Bob Dylan like some sort of lunatic, which if you ever watch my film, if it comes out, you'll see that I was I was, I was was close to being a borderline stalker, but I managed to pull back. So, um, yeah, no, I, I am, I'm still a fan and, um, and, and, and I'm in awe of very talented musicians. When you start to get excited about a musician and you want to photograph them, is it the music that pulls you in first or do you see some pictures or some footage of them and think, oh, I really want to photograph them because they're interesting looking? It can be both, but actually it's a good question, Ange, because it's actually the latter. Because I remember with Sinead O'Connor, I hadn't heard her music at that point, but I saw her being interviewed, this exquisite sort of woman with the number one haircut sort of nervous but kind of feisty and I'm thinking who are you the huge eyes as well yeah that's really intriguing you know um with um Gabriel's I was at Glastonbury that year and I'd, I'd never heard of Gabriel's and and I it was only because I wasn't allowed to do shots in another stage I was standing there and out comes this man in a kilt with this extraordinary voice and I'm, I was just my jaw just dropped off like oh <laughs> 
And I was, I was like, I've got to meet them afterwards. I must go and find this group. It's ridiculous, you know, this old lady that I am, you know. I was like, no. I, and I, I went to Coventry, on, you know, and blagged my way into one of their gigs and made them allow me to take a picture of them. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it sounds like you've definitely still got the passion and the fire for it. It's fading, but I'm, you know, I'm still there. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. So your penultimate number then, please. Let's do number 10. Number 10. What is your advice for anyone wanting to get into music photography? Well, the, uh, first I'll give you the standard reply, which is find a local band, local musicians and work with them because they need you as much as you might need them to practice on. So I'd say that to, I'd say that to everybody if, if they want to start doing music photography even if you live in the countryside go to the local pub or or look in the newspaper and try to start shooting or in your college or in your school the local musicians because you've got to practice first anyway plus it's very useful for them because everybody thinks they can shoot it with the phone but I, you know you'll, you'll do a better job with your camera that's the first answer but as far as becoming a professional music photographer i'm not too sure that it's even possible now except for maybe some fluke you know because because there isn't a music press that's paying and people want stuff for nothing to go online and so on making a living from it is i'm not sure that it's a good idea to even think that way without wanting to 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 put anybody off it's just to be realistic about it and so i also always say and i say it to myself too that make sure photography is your first love and that photographing rock stars and musicians is your second Right. Got you. Yeah. A lot of music photographers, such as yourself, you know, you do the live acts photography, but you also do portrait shoots and behind the scenes and stuff like that for album covers and promotional materials. Is that really where the money is? And is the, I mean, not talking big money, obviously, you know, is, is the concert photography like the in with those bands? It's very difficult to get into. It's hard to get passes for photographers now as well. Because you've got your Gettys, you know, like at Glastonbury, for example, there's probably something like 12 or f even more, uh, 15 maybe photographers from Getty. They're, they're all covering all the different stages and things like that. And the big concerts at the O2 or, you know, your Billy Eilish's or the big bands that, you know, they, they've got either their own photographers that are doing their social media or you've got the press photographers, you know, Dave Hogan and people like that who, who provide pictures direct from the camera to the picture desk. There's no, there's no pause, and or they've got um, people doing the processing on the side of the stage, and the, you know it goes straight from from the camera into somebody who does all the, you know the metadata and it, it's straight off. And those people tend to be working for agencies, and therefore they don't earn the copyright. Mm, right. So yeah, they're probably paid, or the band might pay, or the record company might pay, but you won't, you won't be paid a huge amount, and also you may not you may lose your copyright and your rights to the material. Yeah, so that's not great news, is it? That's not great news for things like Rock Archive in the future either because you'll have Getty selling the prints rather than Rock Archive. And... Yes, that's right. And in any case, we found that we don't sell very much contemporary work at all because, you know, if you can take a picture at a gig on your phone, you maybe won't bother to buy a print anyway. And then the photographers who are shooting it may not. Like the Getty photographers, I remember, oh, this is a good point, they when the Rolling Stones were playing at Glastonbury, there was a Getty photographer I was looking at. I was going, that's brilliant, that's brilliant. My God, that's fabulous. He goes, well, they'll never see the light of day. Those pictures will be in the library of Getty. They won't use them anyway because they're not a picture of Mick and um, uh, Keith standing together. And so some brilliant picture taken from the top of an ice cream van. I remember the guy got himself on top of an ice cream van and got these fantastic shots. But he just said he can't use them and they won't use them. Rock Archive, we could use it, but we won't see it. Oh, that is a real shame. So you may be better off being in the crowd, really, and taking pictures. I do know some photographers that I encourage very strongly and say, well, just get in the crowd. Or, you know, if one photographer in Rock Archive buys a seat and he shoots from his seat, and he gets the best shots because he's shooting the whole show from his seat, but he has to be careful he won't be caught. Yeah, but he's getting the atmosphere as well, as well as the performance. Yeah. Okay, so your last number then, please. Let's go for seven. Number seven, do your clients usually have firm ideas about the type of images that they want or do you decide what works best? That question is from Belinda. And I think thinking specifically about the either the behind the scenes or the album cover type shoots, portrait work. 
two very different things, of course. Sometimes a behind-the-scenes shot could be good for an album sleeve. I haven't done as many album sleeves as people who do album sleeves, by the way. I've done very few, really, considering my long career. Right. I think my colleagues who do do album sleeves, they quite often work directly with the artist or sometimes an art director. And these are quite carefully organised pictures. I have done that myself as well. I've done done that kind of work. And it's very nice, but it's not my speciality. I think of myself more as a photojournalist, really. And whilst I like to do portraits... I do like to do portraits of people with lighting. On, on, I used to use a Hasselblad a great deal. Um, I can do that kind of work, but I'm not very good at taking direction. Fair enough. So it's, it's good to know what you're good at and what you're not good at, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, Jill, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. It's been really lovely chatting with you. Thank you very much, Ange. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the She Clicks Women in Photography podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. You'll find links to Jill's website and social media channels in the show notes. I'll be back with another episode soon. So please subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast platform and tell all your friends and followers about it. You'll also find She Clicks on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube if you search for She Clicks Net. So until next time, enjoy your photography.